So, and now back to our regular scheduled programming. Last week we took a detour talking about freedom. We learned freedom ain't free unless it's in Christ Jesus. No matter how you try to bottle it up, celebrate it, light it on fire, fireworks and everything else, if it's not found in Christ Jesus, then it is not true freedom. And so we're going to get back into our sermon series, which this part we're going to actually bring to a close today, and I'm going to start another part on next week. Um, but we've been dealing with mastering the lifestyle of the reach. And we understand that reach stands for repeatedly extending a Christian hand. And I teach this every few years or so, but I think it's more relevant now than it has ever been any time that I've preached it before, partly because of the pandemic has taught us to be inward. It has taught us to be selfish. It has taught us to draw in. And that is everything opposite of what the Bible tells us and what Jesus has told us to do. He told us that we need to go out. And so he's used, the enemy has used fear to keep us in. I promise you, we were in a grocery store, uh, uh, I think like last year, and um, it was in the, in the midst of the height of the pandemic, and a man fell out in the store. And I promise you, everybody around just stood there. And it's because of the climate. They were afraid to touch him. They were afraid to assist him or to help him because they feared what would happen or if he was contagious or if he had corona or whatever it is. But when we hesitate to care for people because of our fear, it's a bad place to be. And so we need to be reminded that God has put us here in this earth that we reach, that we are touching someone. And just to recap, if you haven't been here with us, we understand that a, a spirit-led church is a vision-led church, and we do have a vision here. It's up on the wall outside, and we've been putting it up the last few Sundays. And we understand that we are a church of multicultural, multigenerational individuals and families united as one family in God. And our mission, the first part, is we have an assignment to reach. And not only reach, but to reach the lost, because everybody ain't lost. Hallelujah. Everybody is not lost. And this part is so important as we, as we finish this reach part. To reach is to stretch or extend so as to touch or meet, to establish communication with, to succeed in touching or seizing with an outstretched hand. And it's so great that God, he, he makes uh, adjustments for our deficiencies. My reach may only go so far, and this is all that he's holding me accountable for. Well, my husband got go-go gadget arms in. He reached a long way. He's not, be, he's not holding me accountable for my husband's reach. He's only holding me accountable for where I'm able to reach. Pastor John did a wonderful job talking about the difference between an effective reach and an overreach. We find that we like to overreach and reach past what God has put right around us to reach. And so it's amazing that we will do above and beyond for a stranger, but won't reach to the ones right in our household or reach to that one cubicle next to you at work, the one you don't like. He's only holding us accountable based on our ability to reach. And so in this part, we did the goal. Remember, we talked about the, the Great Commission. Jesus told the disciples, I want you to go. And it's not just a message to the disciples, it is to all of us. We are here so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in the earth. It's not us, it's his work that we are agreeing to be a part of. It's not our work. And when we think it's our work, we really mess up this reach thing because then we try to judge who we should reach and how we should reach them. Hallelujah. And so he is, he's given us an instruction to go, but there's a few things before you go. Number two, we talked about we have to know our biases because our biases can hinder our reach. And it's amazing about the woman at the well. We talked about her. She was immoral. She was a woman and she was a Samaritan. Those were three biases that had developed in the culture. And Jesus had to decide to overcome all of those biases because it was more important for a living soul to receive eternal water than it was to be held up by what we think or how our, our opinions of others are framed. And today, I want to talk about being led by the Holy Spirit in your reach. Because like I said, everybody ain't lost. 
When we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in our reach, our reach will always be effective. But if we decide when we go reach, oh, Satia is here. Hi, Satia. She's with us from Washington State. Everybody say hi to Satia. We missed her. We so glad she came back to see us. Okay, sorry. It's like squirrel. You know, it, I, I do that every now and then. We're going back to the Holy Spirit, lay a reach. So you have to be led by the Spirit in your reach. Don't just take it upon yourself that you know what work God is doing in the lives of others. So I want to talk about this obeying the nudge. That's, that, that's, that's my subtopic today, obeying the nudge. What is that? You know, most people say, something told me. You ever heard people say that? Or you were getting ready to go to the left and something told you to go to the right and you find out that there was an accident on the left. I got a something told me. Well, I don't say something told me, but I got an example of obeying the nudge. We are in mid-recruiting season for my son, and it is on my nerves. I'm going to talk about it next week. I'm going to tell y'all all about it. Y'all going through life with me. They, it's going to be in my sermons. If I'm going through it, you're going to know. We all, we doing life together. And so it is on my last nerve, but I'll talk about that next week. But so this, this week alone, we were, we drove to Harrisburg on Wednesday. He had a showcase and a tour on Thursday in Philadelphia. We came back from Harrisburg on Thursday and he was supposed to be at the airport to catch a flight to Atlanta for a showcase on Saturday with a flight coming back on Saturday night, leaving Atlanta at 9.30 p.m. I knew when we scheduled this, I just wasn't comfortable because it would be one thing if it was him, but his father was with him. So how was we gonna have church if, if, if the, 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 the worship pastor and the drummer was not going to be here on Sunday morning. So now my anxiety is on 10 already. I'm talking to the audio people. Okay, we just going to play church. We going to play a video. They watching it at home. We going to watch it at home too. So I didn't know how we were going to figure this thing out. And so what, what we, we went to Harrisburg, had a good time. He had the camp of his life on Thursday, did a wonderful job. And so he got hurt in the camp on Thursday. He hurt his foot. And uh, we started talking about this, and I was like, I don't know about Atlanta. I don't want to, if it's not bad, I don't want to risk him being on it, and it gets worse. And we went through this whole thing, and I kept feeling that, that little nudge. The nudge is like, anybody got an Apple Watch? Who got an Apple Watch in here? Okay. Do you know in your Apple Watch how it gives you those little pulses every now and then? Or like if you, ever, you do your GPS and you have an Apple Watch on, it tells you when to turn. It just, it just nudges you like it's just a little... It's just a little nudge, or maybe a Fitbit when you've reached your, uh, your goal or whatever. It's just, it's not nothing that is overpowering, and if you don't get used to it, you'll ignore it. It's just a little nudge. That's how the Holy Spirit does. It's just, he just nudges you a little bit. He is a gentleman. He's not going to overpower you. He's not going to overtalk you, and he's not going to override your will. Okay? And so I, I felt the little nudge a few times in this conversation, and then so we made the decision, we're not going to go to Atlanta. I'm just going, we're going to chalk the money. We're not going to go to Atlanta. Don't you know that flight was delayed on Saturday night? And it's, it, it wasn't nothing. Jesus didn't come down out the sky and say, don't go to Atlanta, you know? It, I think when we think about hearing from God and hearing from the Holy Spirit, we're waiting for this, this, this voice to come out the sky and all of this other stuff, and it doesn't work like that. He is a gentleman. It's in the simple Simple nudge. So I'm glad to report that my husband and my son is here for worship and y'all not watching it on TV. So we're going to talk about being spirit-led in our reach. And we understand we did a whole series on the Holy Spirit. If you're not familiar, go back and watch it on YouTube. We did about seven or eight weeks just on the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was given to live inside those who believe in Jesus in order to produce God's character in the life of the believer. And simply stated, we call it the GPS life's gps god's positioning system just like on your gps on your phone or in your car you can put in a destination and the, the gps will give you turn by turn instructions do you know that that the holy spirit will give you turn by turn instructions in life he will let you know he will show you he will tell you but you have to be sensitive to the nudge to the to the little nudge and so today I want to talk for the time that I have left, that time go real fast. I want to talk about the conversion story from Saul 
to Paul. And some people may be uh, uh, familiar with this, but I'm going to give a little bit of background. Can I tell you that you should go home and read this this week? I'm giving you like the cliff note version. You need to go home and read the real thing. There's no way that I could teach you everything, even in these few verses, in a 20-minute time frame. You're supposed to go home and you're supposed to do some reading and some research too. That's what's wrong with the church. Y'all let them preachers tell you anything and then go home and study it for yourself. I tell everybody, go home and make sure I'm, what I'm saying is right. I mean, I, I'm glad that you're here and you're listening to me and you believe me, but please go check and do a reference every now and then because I could get off too. And the whole ship don't have to derail just because I get off if we all studying and doing our part. Hallelujah. It's more important for God's church to stand than it is for me to be your pastor. Acts 9. Let's go, Acts 9. Acts 9. So here's the lesson approach. Just the real quick version. It's, break up, it's broke up in three sections. And the first part is about Saul himself. Acts 9, 1 through 2, man. Saul, in his pre-conversion state, he was killing people. He was persecuting Christians. He was cutting people's heads off. And he thought he was doing the work of the Lord. He was, a, he was a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He was taught in religion. He was the religious. And he just decided that this whole new Jesus thing was coming against what he believed. And so he started to persecute and got, got decrees and stuff to kill Christians because he was trying to keep his doctrine pure. And then when you go down to verse 3, Saul and Jesus have this run-in. Anybody ever had a run-in with Jesus? <laughs> Man, they had a run-in. He knocked Saul off his high horse. He blinded him and knocked him off his horse. Saul lost his sight. And Jesus began to speak to him. The Holy Spirit said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, like, I thought I was doing the right thing. Anybody ever thought you were doing the right thing? And so he gives him some instructions. He loses his sight. And then the third part is where we're going to pick it up in Acts 9, 10 through 25, when, when God begins to talk to Ananias. And so the, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to Ananias and says, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Now, I got to be honest. I'm a little like Ananias. Because Ananias said this, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. You know what he said? Lord, he killed people. I mean, I, I, I hear you and I understand what you want me to do. But I need to remind you that he kills people, especially people like me. There's no way that I'm going to go to somebody that killed people. And then the Lord says unto him, go, there's that go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Don't, aren't you glad that God see who you be and, who you, and not who you are? See, Ananias was responding to who Saul was or in the present. God responded with who he shall be. See, when God looks at you, he doesn't see who you are and all your imperfections and all your shortcomings and all that. He has already declared who you shall be and he is speaking to your future. He doesn't see you as downtrodden. He doesn't see you as, 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 as a wretch undone. He doesn't see your failure and mistake. He see you as, the, as king's kids and children of the most high God. I feel that a little bit this morning. He looks at you and he says, my daughter, my son, well, I did this last night. I don't care what you did last night. You stuck in who you are, but you need to be moving towards who you be. 
So then after Ananias got his head cracked a little bit, he went. He went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to me, uh, to appear to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because you can't see if you're not spirit with, filled with the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling on the inside of you and you're not letting him lead, you are blind. That's why you keep walking into stuff. You keep knocking your head on stuff. You keep finding yourself in situation after situation because you can't see. You need the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Now just imagine this. If Ananias would have just judged Saul based on what he was because he didn't have the ability to see who he was going to be. Saul became Paul who wrote almost all of the New Testament who began to plant the church and we still reference him and we still ask him about life even on today. Oh, y'all don't ask Paul that thorn in your flesh and your side. We go to his scriptures often to find encouragement on how to walk and how to live this thing. But if Ananias would have chose not to be obedient based on his bias, and not only his bias, we have to reach at the right time. Because see, this is not your work, it's God's work. And so he's dealing with the heart of the person before he sends you to reach, but you can't delay. I told the story this morning in another class. I got so many stories, I just didn't know which one to choose. But this one particular story, my Nick, my Nick hasn't been here because he's been working on Sundays. We speak a new job in his life. I need to see him on Sunday morning. But he was having one of the hardest days of his life. Life had happened to him. And he was ready to give up. And I woke up, and everybody know me, I like to shop. And I figured out Jesus respects that I like to shop because everybody I need to reach, he sent them to the mall. <laughs> and so I was in Cuyahoga Falls, which I normally don't go. And we were in a store and it was like right at the moment, I'm like, we need to go to Target. I don't know why I want to go to Target. Target ain't my favorite place. They really don't have much of nothing, but you spend a lot of money. I still ain't figured that out. <laughs> but I had that go to Target. And I went to Target, and as I was coming to the register, I think we was buying nothing. Nick was standing at the cash register. And I said, excuse me, sir, are you buying me something today? And he turned around, and it was like he saw Jesus. His tears welled up, and he said, I can't believe you're here. I said, well, I shop all the time. You should expect me to be here. And he began to tell me the story of how he was ready to give up and how he was ready to end it all. And he was just talking to Jesus and he didn't know if Jesus heard him. And there I stood. That story has always grounded him in his faith when he tries to go back to those dark places because he remembered that Jesus cared enough about me to send the pastor to me. I didn't have to go to the pastor. The pastor showed up on my behalf. Do you know that people can't reach Jesus without reaching you first, without you reaching them first? You didn't meet him on your own. You didn't start talking to him by yourself. You didn't start living this. It was somebody who reached you that you were able to reach him. But you got to reach at the right time. Do you know what kind of planning Jesus had to do to make that all line up? He had to start talking to me at the right time. I mean, you're talking about maybe a 30-second deficit, a 30-second difference. I'd have missed him. He'd have missed me. He was so intentional about what he wanted to do in Nick's life. And I just happened to be the available person on the other end. 
just following. But that ain't the only time it happened. It happens a lot. It was another time we were sitting in the foyer, and everybody who knows me, I got a little bit of OCD, and I get tired of stuff looking the same. And so I come in and be like, I want to change all this, move all this, tear all this down. I don't like none of this no more. And I had one of those moments. And so we decided to go over to go look for some new decorations in the foyer. I wasn't planned to be there. Matter of fact, I wasn't even scheduled to be at the church that day. Nothing happened. I was in the store, and one of my members had been let go unjustly. They were escorting her out. I was in the aisle that they chose to escort her out of. Now this store is huge. It's about 40, 60 aisles in this place. Out of all the aisles, if she'd have came down any other aisle, I would have missed her. I wouldn't have been there. But they escorted her into my arms. And I was able to minister to her when she thought life was over. It's a simple. And the more you learn to obey the nudge, the more nudges you will get. Some of us haven't heard or felt a nudge because we've ignored them. And when people's souls are on the line, God has to send a for show. He has to nudge you quick because timing is everything. Paul, Saul's heart had to be ready to receive Ananias. If he'd have went before the time, Ananias would have killed him. But waiting for the nudge at the right time, his heart was ready to receive. I want everyone in this sanctuary to know that God wants to send you to reach to somebody. I don't care how messed up you think you are. Remember, he is, he is speaking to you based on who you be. It doesn't matter what you've been through, what you've gone through, what you're still messed up, what you still got to work on, all of that. All of that sounds great, but he just wants you to be obedient. You don't have to know a scripture. You don't have to have a Bible, but if you are obedient to the nudge and you reach at the right time, Saul became Apostle Paul because of the obedience of one man. What is God going to do in the lives of the people who you reach? I'm standing on this stage because some people took the chance to reach. Can I tell you, you are enough? <laughs> he deemed you worthy. You don't have to have a title or a platform or a stage. You don't have to worry about what your past, I got a past too, I'll tell you about that too. He wants you to reach right where you are. We in the end times. People are leaving up out of here. They're dying without Jesus. All because we ignore the nudge and we refuse to reach. Lord God, we thank you for everybody that's under the sound of my voice in the sanctuary or online. Light the fire of reach in each one of them. I don't care how old they are, from the youngest in the room to the oldest in the room, they can, they can reach within their capacity that you've given them. Sometimes reaching is just smiling at somebody calling somebody or just giving somebody a hug. Whatever it is, let us all be sensitive to the nudge that we are others-minded and that we care more for others than we care for ourselves. That we be your hands and your feet here in the earth. 
that it's not our work, but we agree to participate with yours. We ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on and give the Lord.